I was drawn to this topic by a contest of ideas about the effects of globalization on uh, labor conditions around the world. And what I noticed was most of the debate was rested on anecdotes and that there had been no large effort to bring evidence to bear on this question. And so I decided to do the research necessary to bring a broad body of evidence from a number of countries to bear to try and answer this question about how globalization affects working conditions and labor rights around the world. Yes, well, the oldest idea of the effects of globalization on labor conditions really goes back to international trade theory, where uh, in very brief form the idea is that free trade leads resources to move towards their most productive uses. Uh, and when they're in their most productive uses, uh, they have the maximum scope for monetary and non-monetary compensation. So the idea is the kinds of adjustments that go with free trade, while painful in the short run, lead to improved labor conditions in the long run. The, uh, I should say that in recent years, that uh, oldest idea has been countered to some extent by assertions that globalization sets off a kind of race to the bottom. And uh, the assertion involved in most race to the bottom arguments is that as countries compete to improve the scale of their exports and to attract foreign direct investment, they will degrade their labor conditions. Well, <clears throat> I try to muster the evidence on the effects of free trade uh, on the effects of international migration and the activities of multinational corporations on a set of working conditions and a set of labor rights. The working conditions that I focus on are the usual wages, hours of work, and uh, measures of job safety. The labor rights that I focus on are the four labor rights that are currently stressed by international organizations. Uh, those are freedom of association, non-discrimination, abolition of forced labor, and reduction of child labor. Oh, a long list of things. The, um, I suppose the uh, broadest findings is at the end of the 20th century, which was certainly a period of expanded globalization, uh, you find improvements in all measures of labor conditions, both working conditions and labor rights. Secondly, when you look at the data, you find that the improvements were greatest in countries that were open to free trade. Uh, and the levels and rate of improvement in conditions were poorest in countries that were closest to international trade, <laughs> closed to international trade. The um, effect of economic growth is uh, quite noticeable. Basically, all measures of working conditions and labor rights improve when countries grow. Uh, and this is important because the burden of the evidence is that countries that shift from closed trade policies to open trade policies grow more rapidly. So free trade has an effect on working conditions by stimulating the GDP per capita of most countries. Free trade also has an additional effect uh, on labor rights. That is, in addition to the improvements in labor rights that come through trade's improvement of uh, GDP, uh, there's some somewhat mysterious additional effect in improving these rights. Another finding, um, <clears throat> excuse me, another finding pertains to international migration. Here the evidence is mostly historical, particularly from the first wave of globalization, uh, in which there were few barriers to international migration. Uh, the international migration, particularly across the Atlantic Ocean, that occurred then greatly narrowed wage differences between uh, Europe and, and the United States. Nowadays, the incentives to move between countries are at least as great, um, but on the other hand, there are more political barriers to, to migration. So to some extent, the potential for international migration to produce greater world equality is being uh, thwarted by the um, restrictive immigration policies of many destination countries. Also, uh, the research found that um, multinational corporations, on average, um, are associated with better rather than worse labor conditions uh, in the countries they operate. They pay higher wages, they have superior non-pecuniary conditions of employment, on average. Uh, 
Uh, and also when you look at the patterns of foreign direct investment, you find that most of the investment flows between uh, countries uh, that are already quite industrialized. You do not find a pattern of foreign direct investment flowing towards the countries with the poorest working conditions. The final finding I guess I should emphasize pertains to international labor standards because part of this debate has argued that we need a system of strongly enforced international labor standards in order to prevent globalization from eroding labor conditions. Uh, the findings uh, of my research are, first of all, that the existing system of international labor standards has not produced uh, advances in labor conditions. Really powerful effects have been the effects of globalization. The reason for that is that while there is a positive correlation across countries between the extent to which they sign on to the labor standards and the quality of their labor conditions, uh, in effect, that correlation reflect, reflects a tendency for countries to sign on to standards that they have already achieved rather than sign on to commitments to change their standards. So one could say that the overall conclusion of the book is that the mechanisms of globalization thus far have proven to be a, a more reliable method of advancing labor conditions than uh, the international system of labor, condition, of labor standards. Well, what it says is that there's no evidence that I've been able to find in the data for over 100 countries uh, that the race to the bottom view is correct. Uh, is specifically, you do not find that greater export performance is associated with poorer labor conditions. And as I mentioned earlier, you do not find that foreign direct investment is attracted to countries with, with uh, poor working conditions and very poor labor rights. Um, on, the, on the other hand, you do find that um, labor conditions are improved in countries that shift to open trade policies and that expand their uh, exports and imports. You find that uh, the multinational corporations that are a part of the foreign direct investment flows uh, use, on average, superior working conditions and provide superior labor rights to the local companies uh, that they compete with in the host countries. So um, what I get out of this is the original contest is that the older vision of international trade theory about how free trade would affect labor conditions uh, seem to have uh, the bulk of the empirical support. Uh, well, two very interesting sorts of responses. Most of the economists who read it or discuss it with me says, well, every economist knows that. <laughs> and I suppose that's because that is because most economists are brought up with international trade theory. Um, on, on the other hand, if I ask the people, well, where would you send someone who wanted to see the evidence on this issue, they agreed there, there was no evidence out there before. Um, I have not heard, uh, I have not had extensive feedback from uh, people who uh, believe the race to the bottom ar argument. Um, most of those race to the bottom assertions uh, flow from specific anecdotes. Mm -hmm. And my view is that by and large, those anecdotes are probably true, but they are not typical of the general situation. And I think that's the con contribution of the book. It shows that when you take a broad look at trade and migration patterns and, and foreign direct investment and relate that to labor rights and working conditions, um, you, you don't see the patterns that are implied by different anecdotes. So these anecdotes, as true as they may be individually, just do not adequately describe the typical situation or typical relationship between these forces of globalization and labor conditions.